Okay, good afternoon or good morning or good evening, everyone, depending on which time zone uh, you are in. Uh, welcome to this uh, book talk hosted and organized here by the Center for Comparative and Public Law at the University of Hong Kong. My name is Alex Schwartz. I am Deputy Director of the Center for Comparative and Public Law. And I am very, very pleased to welcome two distinguished scholars in the fields of comparative constitutional law and constitutional theory, Professors Gary Jacobson and Yaniv Rosnai, uh, here to speak to with us today about their new book, Constitutional Revolution, published this year with Yale University Press. Professor Gary Jacobson is the Malcolm McDonald Professor of Constitutional and Comparative Law in the Department of Government and Professor of Law at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, in addition to this new book, Constitutional Revolution, uh, he is also author of the well-known book, Constitutional Identity, published with Harvard University Press in 2010. Uh, Yana Brozlai uh, is Associate Professor at the Harry Radziner Law School Interdisciplinary Center Here's Leah. His book, Unconstitutional Constitutional Amendments, uh, some of you may know it, uh, was published in 2017 with Oxford University Press uh, and was awarded the inaugural International Society for Public Law Book Prize. The new book that we're speaking about today, Constitutional Revolution, published this year with Yale University Press, will be no doubt an important contribution to the fields. Uh, it will bring new clarity and nuance to a much used but under theorized idea the idea of a constitutional revolution and will, I think, stimulate some new and fruitful uh, trajectories in the field and the study of constitutional change going forward. So without any uh, further background on our authors in the book, I will let the authors go ahead and speak. They will speak about the book for roughly 40 minutes, after which we will have an opportunity for questions and answers with the authors and discussion. So thank you very much. Please go ahead, uh, Yanov and Gary. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting us. Uh, I guess we'll proceed uh, with uh, me beginning to talk about the book, and then I'll hand the baton over to, uh, to, to Yanni. So, <coughs> and excuse me, since I just rolled out of bed, if I'm <laughs> uh, lacking uh, coherence. The, the, the purpose of this book is really to invite theoretical and comparative reflection on this very vexed concept of the constitutional revolution. You know, despite its pervasive usage in political and scholarly discourse, the terms application to so many different sorts of things really prompted us uh, to want to explore the concept's essential attributes. I think of the book as an exercise really in middle range constitutional theorizing, an effort to clarify an idea that fundamentally lacks canonical meaning. Uh, to a degree it builds on our previous work, which dealt with, as you mentioned, in my case, the constitutional uh, identity of constitutions, and uh, for Yaniv, the problem of the unconstitutional constitutional amendment. And of course, the last 10 years or so have revealed just how, how controversial those ideas are. In fact, I could write another book on constitutional identity, simply uh, entitling it the, the Abuses of Constitutional Identity. Anyway, for, for me and for Yaniv, the study of comparative constitutional development, we thought could benefit from a similar conceptual account of radical constitutional transformation. So our book can be seen as really following in the tradition of Sartori and others who emphasize the importance of concept uh, formation, concept uh, refinement and elucidation. Here's, here's what caught, caught our attention. So some of the most prominent examples of what are thought to be constitutional revolutions uh, actually reveal features consistent with arguably legitimate processes of nullification and replacement. They include cases where a constitutional regime is newly installed and others where a radical departure occurs within the existing parameters of the constitutional system. And so, and so we ask, 
Suppose a constitution is altered in some paradigm shifting way, either formally or informally, through far reaching amendments, judicial interpretation, normal political behavior. Can the concept of the constitutional revolution be made in effect to accommodate the consequences of these developments, which conventionally are seen as essentially non-revolutionary. For example, take uh, Lincoln's first inaugural address, where he said famously, and I'm quoting, whenever the American people grow weary of the existing government, they can exercise their constitutional right of amending it or their revolutionary right to dismember or overthrow it. I like to call this uh, the, uh, the weariness option. Uh, to exercise the latter option, the revolutionary option, might of course culminate in a subsequent constitutional revolution. And our question is, might the first do as well? That is to say, exercising the option uh, to, uh, uh, to change the constitution through uh, the normal legal processes. Put another way, uh, Hans Kelsen said of a revolution that it occurs, quote, whenever the legal order of a community is nullified and replaced by a new order in an illegitimate way, not prescribed by the first legal order. We think this definition fails to capture the, uh, the oxymoronic challenge posed by the constitutional revolution. We see a similar problem, <coughs> excuse me, in Hannah Arendt's view. Uh, in her account, the constitutional revolution made sense only as a descriptive term to refer to what happens when a violent rupture in political continuity liberates a people from oppression and then leads to the adoption of a freedom enhancing constitution. We think the concept of constitutional revolution is broader, more capacious than is often supposed. Once the criteria for a constitutional revolution are divested of the requirement of extra legality, the types of change that can be accommodated include various things. New constitutional arrangements sanctioned by, by authority of the previous order, Hungary, South Africa, Chile. New constitutional arrangements imposed by an external power, Japan, Iraq, major constitutional departures legislatively enacted, Canada, Great Britain, major constitutional departures secured through the use of the amendment power, United States, maybe even Norway, major constitutional departures engineered through the interpretive power and reach of a court of law. Again, the United States, but certainly, as we'll see later, Israel, Colombia, South Africa. Precisely because of the shifts in constitutional direction emerging from these sorts of political activities are initiated and driven by constitutionally sanctioned institutions wielding procedurally correct power, it may be difficult to appreciate the paradigm altering potential that, are in, that is inherent within them. We think that our case studies actually make this a little less difficult. Let me just outline, before talking about a couple of those case studies, outline uh, very, very quickly the major points of our book. Uh, there are uh, five or six that I just want to speak to very, very quickly. The first one is already that uh, uh, one that I've alluded to in these remarks which is that the distinction between illegal and legal transformations is for us not decisive for establishing the existence of a constitutional revolution, although it may help us in differentiating among the various types. And in fact, we develop uh, such a typology of constitutional revolution. Second, we emphasize the substance of what changes rather than the process by which such change comes about. A constitutional revolution for us is defined as a paradigmatic displacement 
in the way constitutionalism, <coughs> excuse me, is experienced in a given polity. How the transformation came about may affect its legitimacy and its durability, but it is the material content of the change that is for us conceptually paramount. Third, a constitutional revolution will be accompanied by big changes in constitutional identity. Not every mutation in identity will bring a shift of such magnitude as to be considered revolutionary. Uh, the point here is that we do not resolve this question. That is to say, the question of where the tipping point is uh, when it reaches that point at which one can uh, uh, designate an event, a constitutional revolution. So we invite this kind of conversation. Were the civil rights, uh, the post-Civil War amendments in the U.S. Constitution, uh, did they constitute a, <clears throat> a second uh, American uh, revolution, uh, or were, were they simply the fulfillment uh, redemptively of uh, founding aspirations. That's a conversation we can have, and that's the sort of thing that, uh, that we're trying to encourage. <clears throat> Fourth, a constitutional moment may or may not accompany the onset of a constitutional revolution. Those times in which a policy experiences a substantial reorientation in constitutional practice and understanding absent such a moment, are no less revolutionary for the incremental aspect that happens to mark their arrival. So from Ackerman's very famous account, we have been led to believe that you know, thunder and enlightening is a precondition for a constitutional revolution. We simply disagree. Fifth, the characteristic of constitutions that is in fact endemic uh, to constitutionalism in all its great variety is a, a fundamental disharmony that is really the engine for, the, for change in, in constitutional identity. When we talk about disharmony, we're speaking of disharmony within a constitutional order, within a constitutional document, uh, as well as the disharmony that exists between the document and uh, the facts on the ground. So take a case like Ireland, which in its constitution is committed both to a certain Catholic view uh, as well as to liberal democratic uh, politics. Uh, the disharmonic engagement between those two strands of its identity ultimately uh, is the engine for change, just as it is when <clears throat> the uh, broader uh, polity has uh, come to resist features within the Constitution and then change results uh, from the resulting, uh, resulting dissonance. And finally, <clears throat> to an extent that varies from case to case, the novelty of constitutional transformation in our account will draw upon resources that are well entrenched in the historical past. <coughs> Excuse me. So in some cases, the term revolution actually takes on a kind of pre-1789 cyclical or astronomical meaning. Uh, for us, this simply means uh, that we should try to disabuse ourselves of the notion that revolutions must entail a radical separation from the past. One clarification before I move on to a brief uh, consideration of a couple of cases. You might wonder what's the difference between evolution and revolution in our, in our account. <clears throat> evolution is a process, uh, we argue, of developing in detail what is implicit in an existing idea or principle. Revolution involves significant transformation of a particular condition or state of affairs. If what's developed in detail through evolution culminates in radical change, we might then call it 
a revolution. So there may be evolution that culminates in revolution. That's the idea of an extended uh, period before uh, there is a revolutionary con consolidation. So again, uh, the, the core of the book, the meat of the book actually consists of four case studies, Hungary, Israel, <clears throat> Germany, and India. I'm going to let uh, uh, Yaniv talk about the Hungarian and uh, Israeli cases, and I'll just say something about, <clears throat> about Germany and India, and then I'll turn things over to my, to my friend. Um, so Germany, perhaps, perhaps in no other polity does the question of constitutional identity loom as large in legal and political discourse. And what we do is explore the constitutional revolution here in the context of the challenge of European integration, the challenge to that identity represented uh, by uh, the European experiment. Does deference to the decision-making authority of European institutions have potentially revolutionary implications? So by some accounts in Germany, realizing the EU's transformative potential would be tantamount to a constitutional revolution. And to the extent that this is viewed as, as, uh, as an unwelcome outcome, reliance on constitutional identity <coughs> excuse me, becomes essential to its prevention. And what the court in Germany has done is actually develop, uh, forget about judicial review, they now have what they call identity review, which is the way by which they examine the threat in accordance with their understanding of German constitutional identity. So for example, human dignity is the essence of the basic law's identity. It is an unamendable constitutional commitment. Were it to be threatened by a substantially different supranational interpretive meaning, then only the court's resistance could prevent the revolutionary fallout. And that really is the, <coughs> the, the essence of the Lisbon, the landmark Lisbon case. So in this chapter, uh, we go on to consider what is gained as well as lost as a result of what the German court has done, which is to say having become the instrument of constitutional counter revolution. Our analysis of the court's jurisprudence, Lisbon jurisprudence, that part of it that features the guarding of constitutional identity actually yields a quite mixed assessment. So to the extent that the court's defense of identity recognizes that a fundamental reorientation in constitutional essentials can have revolutionary consequences and that these may come about incrementally it rightly underscores a critical interpretive strand in our conceptualizing of the constitutional revolution. To the degree, however, that this preoccupation with identity occurs in a way that is impervious to the dynamic aspect of constitutional identity, the German court actually risks curtailing the reach of its rather extraordinary contribution to constitutional theory and, uh, and practice. Uh, we can see this happening right now uh, in the way that <clears throat> the court's example in Germany, an example which uh, was created for all the right reasons, is being used today by some other European courts. I have Hungary in mind. Uh, 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 in particular, in order to pursue a rather sharply illiberal agenda. Uh, uh, so the static features of the way constitutional identity is employed in the German defense against constitutional revolution, uh, which has a sort of benign purpose behind it, uh, can be easily used 
through the inadvertent misuse by the Germans in order to pursue um, regrettable objectives, such as what we're finding in uh, much of Central and Eastern Europe today. Finally, let me talk uh, very quickly uh, in the remaining minutes that I have on about the, about the Indian case. <clears throat> so one of our principal claims is that the constitutional significance of a radical departure from earlier practice ought not to be minimized or negated by the extended period that often accompanies the consolidation of revolutionary aspirations. And here the, here the example of India is, is, is truly illuminating. And it ta the chapter here <coughs> touches on several key, uh, key themes in our understanding of, of the uh, constitutional revolution. Three in particular, and, and then I'll stop. So in Germany, as I just mentioned, the prospect of paradigmatic displacement came to be regarded as something plainly to be vo avoided. And so playing the identity card served as a buffer against radical transposition. But suppose that realizing the benefits of a constitutional revolution actually looks like an advancement and one, you know, one keenly to be anticipated. Then the dynamic properties within an extant identity actually <clears throat> might be found expedient for achieving this desired result. <coughs> India illustrates this dynamic very well. Our account of India's signature constitutional contribution to jurisprudence, the basic structure doctrine, <clears throat> which of course Yaniv has, uh, has developed very well in his discussion of the unconstitutional constitutional Am amendment, uh, tells, uh, tells this story for us. And it's a story about how the revolutionary commitments of the Indian constitution were set on a course of progressive realization through entirely legal means. Second, as difficult as it is to disentangle the procedural and substantive strands of fundamental constitutional change, the Indian case suggests that, that an emphasis on the aspirational commitments embedded in a document may ultimately prove more instructive than accentuating the specific character of the constituent power that framed the, do the document. So of course in India, there is still great controversy as to how one should even interpret the founding of the Indian constitution. Was it an an example of popular constitutional making or elite constitution making, some combination uh, of, the, of the two. For us, whether India's founding constitutional moment is properly interpreted as the expression of the popular sovereign will is in the end not as important as the long democratic revolution that developed out of that moment. And finally, and here's where I'll conclude, <clears throat> what Nehru referred to as a step-by-step -step progression of the nation's revolutionary unfolding is not simply, not simply the cautious incrementalism that we would expect to accompany you know, societal implementation of massive reconstructive work, rather, we argue in this chapter, it is the inevitable result of the disharmony that is embedded in all constitutions. And this struggle is an ongoing one. Uh, there could be a constitutional revolution in India over the horizon as these two visions, one an inclusive, one an exclusive vision are in 
um, are in constant struggle for ascendance uh, in the uh, in the Indian uh, in the in Indian polity. So uh, uh, these are the two cases that I wanted to just uh, touch upon. Uh, there's a final chapter, final substantive chapter on constituent power where we offer what we think is a more nuanced empirical account of the concept of con constituent power, uh, one that is more nuanced than what exists in available accounts, but I will leave the discussion of that uh, effort uh, to Yaniv, uh, to whom I will now um, <clears throat> pass my baton. So thank you very much. Yanni. Thank you. Very, thank you very much, Gary. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm glad to be here. I wish I could be in Hong Kong, but uh, we'll deal with what we have. Uh, so uh, what I want to do in the 20 minutes or so that I have, I want to first emphasize that this shift of focus that, that we propose from the process to which change occurs to the substance of the change, we believe can lead to a more sensitive and accurate assessment of uh, the historic meaning of constitutional change. And let me give you maybe two counter examples. So on the one hand, changes that we conventionally consider as revolutionary, if you consider the substance, uh, perhaps should not be regarded as revolutionary at all. Think, for example, of the um, Egyptian revolution, 2011. So as things unfolded, it became quite evident that the revolutionaries of Tahrir Square, who were diverse in their goals and aspirations, confronted this disturbing reality of frustrated hopes and unfulfilled uh, expectations. Now, what if there was a extensive constitutional continuity, both with respect to the uh, key provisions in the document, in the constitutional document, and also to the constitutional practice? What basis is there for viewing these developments as revolutionary. Maybe this was just a sham revolution, but not a revolution in the substantive sense. And consider the opposite extreme example. And this is quite, as you'll see, an extreme example. Let's go back to July in 1940, when the French parliament transformed democratic France to a dictatorship and destroyed the foundations of the Third Republic. Uh, but this was done in a way that, that complied with the Third Republic's own legal procedure for constitutional revision, uh, as the basic law of 1875 prescribed. So what happened then? The initial law that amended the Constitution in July 10, 1940, uh, gave Marshal Pétain the power to create a new Constitution, in fact, transferring to Pétain pouvoir constituant, the constituent power. Uh, in his first constitutional act that he issued a day later, on July 11, he proclaimed himself the chief of the French state, and the second constitutional uh, act enacted in the same day defined the powers of the chief state, basically granting Pétain all governmental and legislative powers. Now, this transformation uh, uh, was carried out with full sense of legality, according to the procedure. Now, if you ask Hans Kelsen, this is not a revolution, because it occurred according to the process, but we think it is more accurate to focus on the substance. Substantively wise, this was, of course, a revolutionary change. Now, this leads to some important uh, uh, estimations. The fact that the Constitution has never been formally replaced with a new one paints, according to our uh, uh, proposal, a, a misleading picture. So um, Gary mentioned Norway. So the Norwegian Constitution of 18. 14 has been amended more than 200 times, and it has undergone major reforms, notwithstanding the fact that it has an explicit provision that protects the spirit of the Constitution. Is it the same Constitution today as it was in 1814? Uh, I want to give you maybe uh, two concrete examples uh, that we emphasize uh, in one of the chapters. Uh, take the Chilean example. So the Pinochet Constitution of 1980 included various anti-democratic, you can say, features, political veto power for the military, appointed senators, uh, and others. Now, after Pinochet lost the 1988 presidential plebiscite, 
Negotiations between the opposition coalition and the right-wing supporters of the military regime led to an agreed-upon regime transition in 1989 to a democratic rule. But the mechanism chosen for this transformation was a constitutional reform that modified several articles of the 1980 Constitution, basically removing most authoritarian elements from the Constitution and enhancing its principles of representation, separation of powers, and popular sovereignty. Now, additional reforms between 1990 and 2003 and another one in 2005 continued this transformation as the amendments eliminated or modified most of the remaining um, authoritarian uh, enclaves, if you like. Now, for us, this was a constitutional revolution. Chile has substantively replaced its constitution with a new one, notwithstanding the fact uh, that it was only through amendments. So formally speaking, we still have the same old constitution, but if we look at the substance, it is a new constitution. Uh, the same story goes with Japan, both for Japanese constitution. But I wanna uh, focus in the, uh, the next few minutes on Hungary. So uh, in Hungary, the 1949 constitution, it was a communist constitution. It was uh, modeled after the 1936 constitution of the Soviet Union, it was a communist constitution. But over the course of 1989 and 1990, that 1949 constitution was thoroughly transformed by uh, mainly two constitutional amendments that were aimed explicitly to create a peaceful political transition to a constitutional state, which was based on multi-party system, parliamentary democracy, and a social market economy. Now, these two amendments of 1989 and 1990 were brought about under the rule of law while legal continuity was maintained. Nonetheless, for us, this is no less a revolutionary act than an act that would be extra legal. Now, now nowadays, what we see in Hungary is that after 2010, with the sweeping uh, election victory of the Fidesz party, the Hungarian cultural order is now going yet another drastic change in a different direction. Now the liberal democratic constitution is being transformed to an illiberal uh, constitutional state. So Hungary, in the course of these years, has gone through two constitutional revolutions. Now, why do some countries go for such a transformation through amendments rather than engage openly in a new constitution-making process? There are various reasons. So one reason may simply be a lack of established procedures. We know that constitutions usually address how they are, uh, may be amended, but there are very few constitutions that actually state how they can be totally replaced. Now, in the absence of an existing formal mechanism for creating a new constitution, the most obvious way to pursue such a transformation is through the mechanism of amendment. But there are other possible explanations that are more strategic or political uh, in nature that we uh, mentioned in the book. So adherence to the existing amendment procedure allows the political leaders to cloak their desired changes in legality and continuity, thus framing their actions in some uh, norms of formal legitimacy. A strategy of transformation through amendment may allow the political actors to avoid the heightened risk of failure associated with making an entirely new constitution, because the initiation of the constitution making process uh, uh, could be a risky one. It, it opens the entire constitution for renegotiation and debate. Therefore, it increases costs and invites all kinds of strategic behavior uh, and, uh, uh, from different parties. So an incremental approach to, to such a control replacement that relies on amendment entails lower political costs, uh, and it could be done perhaps uh, in a quicker manner. So it has various advantages uh, uh, in, urgent, uh, in urgent times. And um, also, by being able to preserve some key uh, institutions, for example, in Chile, military autonomy, et cetera, uh, that may be the only way the regime would be willing to consider such transformations. So if you open everything uh, uh, from scratch, the regime might resist it. If you tell the regime, let's do it incrementally and you can preserve some of your powers, then he would be more willing perhaps to make this kind of change. So, um, uh, so this is uh, revolutionary changes through amendments. Now, nowadays, uh, as we know, many of the world constitutions try to block these kind of revolutionary uh, amendments through eternity clauses or unamendable provisions. Uh, 
But a revolution or a constitutional revolution can take place not only through the formal amendment procedure, but also through the court. Let me just say a few words about Israel as an example. So in Israel, there is no formal constitution, although originally this was supposed to be the plan. The Declaration of Independence uh, talked about having elections to consider an assembly that would draft a constitution. And this was indeed in the beginning, there were elections to consider an assembly. But because there were disagreements about the need to have a constitution at that stage, at the early stage, uh, stages of independence, uh, they decided to go uh, through a more incremental process, uh, a stage by stage process, uh, according to which our parliament, the legislature, the Knesset, would enact basic laws, a series of laws that would eventually uh, will become our constitution. So in Israel, there is no one formal document entitled the constitution, but a series of basic laws. Now, from the establishment of the state in 1948 until the early 90s, uh, our parliament enacted uh, only institutional basic laws. In other words, basic laws that regulated the state's institutions, such as uh, the judiciary, the legislature, the ombudsman, etc. But in the early 1990s, the Knesset, the parliament, enacted two basic laws on human rights. And for the first time, these basic laws also included uh, what we know as limitation clauses, limits on the power of the legislator to uh, infringe upon fundamental rights. But the basic laws did not state anything about their constitutional status. Uh, they they uh, neither gave the court explicit authority of judicial review. So it was at first, unclear what is their status and what is their implications on the constitutional order. But three years later, in 1995, in a, a, a huge case of the Israeli Supreme Court, the Mizrahi Bank case, which is our Marbury versus Madison, if you like, uh, the court held uh, the following, that our legislator holds constituent authority, and accordingly, the basic laws have a constitutional status, and these basic laws limit the ordinary legislative powers of the Knesset. And finally, the court has the power to review ordinary legislation vis-a-vis -vis these basic laws and to invalidate laws that are uh, violative of these basic laws. So basically, it was the court through its decision that retrospectively recognized a constitutional revolution from a parliament sovereignty system to a, to a constitutional supremacy system, uh, US style, if you like. Uh, in the years that followed this decision, the court deepened the revolution. Uh, but as Gary said earlier, uh, one of the engines of the revolution is this disharmony between conflicting values. In Israel, the values that are uh, in conflict are Jewish state versus democratic state. And what we see in recent years is a more counter-revolution, an attempt to uh, undermine the constitutional revolution and to enhance the more Jewish principles over the more liberal democratic one that are considered universal rather than particular ones. Uh, I have about five minutes. So I, I wanna end uh, my part with uh, talking about constituent power and what does our concept of constitutional revolution means for the theory of constituent power. Now, if we go back to the thinking that accompanies us ever since the French Revolution, there is this distinction between constituent power and constituted powers, right? As Emmanuel Joseph Sierre declared before the National Assembly in 1789, a constitution presupposes a constituent power. So Sierre makes this distinction between constituent power, the power to create a constitutional order, and constituted powers, all those powers that are created by the constitution, legislator, judiciary, executive, etc. These are two separate powers, one acting outside the constitutional order and the other one acting within it. Uh, but constitutional revolutions brought about by constituted organs, such as courts or legislators, challenge this separation between constituted and constituted powers because they allow constituted organs to exercise constituent power. Now, uh, 
one can examine these kind of transformations in two ways. You can either say that these constituted organs uh, have successfully exercised constituent power, what, what results is a constitutional revolution, or an alternative perspective could say, oh no, these are constituted organs acting ultra-virus in a way, uh, and therefore trying to make an illegitimate uh, transformation. Uh, what is a very important lesson that we've seen from the various transformations, uh, and this is of course related to the concept of constituent power, is that to be successful and to endure, uh, uh, the constitutional revolution should aim to include the people in a meaningful, inclusive, proactive, and deliberative way uh, in order to fulfill the myth of we the people as holders of constituent power. Uh, now, regardless of how historically accurate the story is that we tell ourselves about people as constitution makers, facilitating the process of popular participation in the authorship of the constitution enhances the legitimacy of a constitutional revolution. And accordingly, the more uh, legitimate the constitutional revolution is, the less tendencies could be for a counter constitutional revolutions. Uh, so uh, I think I'll end here and uh, leave something for the uh, Q&A. Thank you very much for this uh, opportunity and invitation. Thank you very much, Gary and Yaniv. Um, I am going to open up the floor to the Zoom uh, Q&A. So uh, those of you in attendance today, uh, you can type in a question through the Q&A box, and I will then pose the question to our two author panelists. Um, to start things off, I, I have a question myself um, for both of you um, about the blurry uh, boundary, I suppose, between <clears throat> the external and the internal perspectives on constitutional revolutions, or you might say between understanding constitutional revolution as uh, a category of analysis for the purpose of, of, of comparative constitutional law scholarship and constitutional theory, and as a category of practice, because of course, in particular contexts, people uh, may be using the idea uh, deliberately uh, for particular political purposes. Um, they may want to downplay the extent of constitutional change uh, because they're worried about people attacking the change as illegitimate, or perhaps they may want to um, exaggerate or accentuate the, the extent of constitutional change uh, for the purposes of uh, ushering in a different approach to say constitutional adjudication. So I can think of, for example, in the United Kingdom, uh, the new labor reforms, which were enacted through statutes there, uh, many would see devolution to Northern Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, and the Human Rights Act, and the Constitutional Reform Act in 2005, which made changes to uh, judicial appointments and created the new Supreme Court. Many would see this period, this epoch, as having uh, created uh, a new constitution even. So Vernon Bognor, for example, would characterize it as such. Uh, others would, of course, accentuate <laughs> the continuity with the past. Uh, and there may be genuine disagreement about that, sort of reasonable disagreement about that, and some of the disagreement may be dispassionate. Uh, other aspects of the disagreement or people within these, uh, these debates may be politically motivated in how they characterize the changes. So how does one, as an analyst, looking at these sorts of scenarios, uh, deal with that? Because uh, on the one hand, I, I imagine you don't want to be entirely indifferent to how people on the ground are understanding their own constitutional context. On the other hand, it seems that the book sort of, because you look at the substance of change, you have to, I guess, leave open the possibility that people can be wrong about whether they've had a constitutional revolution or not. So, um, I, yeah, I'm just very, very keen to hear your thoughts on how to navigate this, this boundary between the external and internal perspectives on the question of constitutional revolution? Well, yes, I mean, you raise a fascinating question and it's one that uh, one has to think about um, in, this, in this context. That is to say, how 
how the effort to clarify a vexed concept in an analytical, dispassionate, detached way, on the one hand, uh, balances against the way in which the concept is actually employed you know, within the political arena for all sorts of purposes, <clears throat> some of which one would, uh, as a citizen, uh, 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 agree with and, and, and in other cases uh, disagree with. I think perhaps uh, uh, the best illustration of the phenomenon and the problem you're raising uh, is one that Yaniv is intimately uh, familiar with in, in, in Israel uh, over the debate about the, uh, about the constitutional, constitutional revolution, where some people um, would argue that the very application of the term uh, has a kind of either a salutary or destructive effect on the political, the political situation. So what we're doing is sort of standing back. It's easier for me because I'm not right there, standing back uh, to assess uh, the degree to which, for example, the changes uh, wrought in the uh, Mizrahi decision that Yanif was talking about actually could be seen uh, according to our criteria as a constitutional revolution, yet people on the ground there uh, have a vested interest uh, in disputing the application of that very term. And it may very well, and I guess I should um, uh, defer to, to Yaniv here, so I'll shut up in just a second, um, uh, but the actual um, originators of that terminology within the, within the Israeli political contest may very well, as things have evolved, <clears throat> uh, have second thoughts uh, uh, about uh, what uh, the insertion of that terminology has done to the course of political, uh, political um, disputation. Uh, and so uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, the, the term itself is very fraught. Uh, with all sorts of political implications. Uh, what we've tried to do um, is really stand away from that. Uh, as, as I suggested in the German case, uh, for example, where uh, the, uh, the developments in uh, the Lisbon case uh, produced a, a very, very welcome result, arguably, within a particular context which then could be extracted out of that context and applied elsewhere in very nefarious ways. Um, we, hold, we have no responsibility for that. <laughs> uh, and yet uh, we, we, we have to try to, to understand the significance of what the concept uh, can mean politically. I don't know, Yanni, you might want to say a little bit more. Yeah, I think I think uh, uh, that's a wonderful question. Gary is absolutely right. I mean, uh, I'm sure people would use in a given polity would use the term revolution or constructive revolution both to delegitimize certain constitutional changes, but also to legitimize any counter revolutionary uh, uh, movements, uh, right? Because there is this sense of legitimacy or illegitimacy that accompanies the sense of revolution, uh, formal legitimacy at least. Uh, now, I, I, I think Gary is correct, and I think that in retrospect, if you would ask Aaron Barak uh, and others, they might say that uh, using the term constitutional revolution uh, was harmful for the constitutional project, and perhaps as a strategic uh, uh, manner, it would have been wiser to emphasize a more uh, limited or narrow change, uh, a small change, if you like. Uh, but again, as Gary said, uh, how people use the term strategically does not undermine uh, from our uh, 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 evaluation. Uh, I want to add another point that uh, I'm not sure we've discussed. Uh, for us, the idea of control revolution is uh, neutral in the sense that a revolution, a control revolution could lead to a better, uh, normative better control order or or worse, 
So the Hungarian example shows precisely this because we see a dual move, one from a, uh, a non-democracy non, non to a liberal democracy uh, country, and an, an, another transformation from an illiberal state, uh, from a liberal state, sorry, to an illiberal one. So both of these changes for us could be regarded as revolutionary, regardless of the result, whether it's good or bad, we do not ask this kind of question. Right, right. If I could just add one thing to that. Um, so uh, let me just use the American example uh, for, for some uh, illustra illustration here. Remember what, uh, uh, what I said early on, <clears throat> that there is a kind of cyclical dimension uh, to the idea of constitutional revolution, uh, that it's not radical in the sense of a, of a, of a, of a uh, severe break with the past necessarily. So uh, when, uh, when the New Deal court constituted this so-called revolution, and known as the, the New Deal revolution, uh, conservatives in this country were somewhat appalled. Uh, you're thrusting upon us a, uh, a revolution uh, that uh, uh, throws into question uh, all of what we have come to believe about our constitution. Uh, this must be understood, therefore, as, in some ways as illegitimate or unfounded. But um, uh, our idea of the constitutional revolution would then require as a response, now wait a second, uh, all that happened in the New Deal revolution was an effort somehow to cycle back to um, um, a more uh, ancient view of the Constitution, manifest, say, in Marshall's jurisprudence, uh, such that what we're doing is, in effect, returning to some original thought about what the constitutional project was all about, uh, so that uh, what appears to be radical, and the term radical, of course, is associated with the generic form of revolution. Radicalism isn't necessarily a part of constitutional revolutions. It might be in some instances, but once you get into the politics of it, as you were suggesting, uh, using our analysis uh, could um, uh, shed considerable light upon the kind of debate that ensues uh, over the term as it is used uh, in practice. Uh, thank you both, both very much uh, for that. It is really uh, great to have uh, you here to talk about the book and, and to answer precisely that sort of question that, uh, that otherwise uh, um, we would uh, not have the opportunity to discuss. So I'm, I'm hoping to now open up the floor to others uh, to take that opportunity. So uh, Kishor Dare asks, uh, what is the likely significance of constitutionalism in the wake of debate over relative efficacy and efficiency of autocratic and democratic political systems in effectively, effectively combating the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, and uh, we have another question here. I'll take them both. Uh, Krista Kovacs asks, a contemporary normative meaning of revolution goes back to Condorcet, according to this, Revolution is, among others, a progressive regime change which aims at freedom. This definition presupposes the existence of despotism. Your definition is broad, broader than that, and it seems that it is also value neutral. Probably that is why you end up calling both the Hungarian regime changes constitutional revolution, although the 1989 one was from autocracy to democracy, and the 2010 one was from democracy to autocracy, as some people would say. Uh, my question is the following. What is the advantage of having such an elastic and value neutral concept? So the first one, it brings us into the debate of the interaction between, uh, or the question of the interaction between your, your project and recent uh, challenges uh, dealing, with the, dealing with the global pandemic, which I don't know if you've had the chance to think about. Uh, and the second one kind of goes back to my, my point or question about, about the analyst's value neutrality, but gives you, I, I think, another opportunity to think about this uh, in broader context, uh, as a, in, in contrast to the use of revolution more generally. So uh, I'll please uh, go ahead and uh, answer those uh, questions as you will. Well, <clears throat> excuse me, maybe, I, maybe I'll say something first on the, on the second question that uh, Krista, uh, Krista raises. 
so uh, when I began my uh, remarks, I reminded you all of uh, Hannah Arendt's famous definition of revolution, and specifically as that as that definition applied to that form which we're calling constitutional, in which she essentially argued what uh, uh, the question also assumes that in some ways uh, we have uh, this idea uh, that when uh, a revolution succeeds, it culminates in a place which brings us uh, to a, uh, um, uh, a more advanced, uh, state of our civilization, we might say. Uh, progress uh, is somehow connected uh, to the revolutionary act, uh, and pr presumably uh, that uh, connects to uh, the constitutional form of revolution as well as revolution in generally. And I just have to say that <clears throat> from our point of view, we, we uh, don't accept that uh, understanding. Uh, because we recognize that uh, there, are, there, are, there are many examples, including the one uh, that uh, Krista mentions with respect to what we uh, suggest is the second Hungarian constitutional revolution. Others might think of it as the first uh, counter-revolution uh, after the one that began in 1989. Uh, and yes, we take an entirely uh, neutral position on that, which is uh, uh, something we uh, are unable to avoid given the assumptions that are built into our understanding of the constitutional, constitutional revolution. Uh, this could be very frustrating to some, I assume, uh, particularly when one gets into uh, you know what Alex was talking about in his question, uh, the politics uh, of a constitutional revolution as opposed uh, to uh, the uh, scholarship about it. And I suppose we'd have to leave it there and uh, people would, uh, uh, as perhaps Krista is, uh, remain uh, critical of that, of that posture of, of, of neutrality, uh, but that's where we are. Um, thank you very much, Gary. I want to say uh, a word on the on the first question regarding COVID nineteen. Uh, so I think this is a great point, uh, and the reason for that uh, has to do with constitutional changes uh, during emergency or under emergency. Now, amending a constitution under emergency conditions, uh, as we know, might not only bring a suspension of fundamental rights, uh, elevation of executive powers. Uh, even if only as an emergency measure itself, but it may also lead to a dissolution of the entire democratic regime. Uh, as we've seen from the past, this amalgamation of the two extraordinary powers, the amending power and emergency powers, uh, have proved to be a common instrument of ostensible constitutional revolution. Uh, and I think this is the reason why many modern constitutions uh, mainly in Eastern Europe, but also in Africa. So you can find it in Albania, Angola, Belgium, Brazil, Cambodia, uh, etc. These co constitutions include what uh, what is often termed circumstantial unamendability or emergency unamendability, limits on the ability to amend the constitution uh, during emergency. So once you have a state of emergency. The amending process is completely blocked uh, in order to protect the constitution from being uh, completely uh, revolutionized because the risk is that the executive would either extend its term, elevate uh, his powers vis-a-vis -vis other branches. So instead of going back to the status quo ante the, uh, the emergency, we would have a, a completely new constitution after the, uh, the emergency. And this, I think, uh, this idea of protecting the constitution from substantive change during emergency, I think it goes back to the Roman dictatorship. The classical and influential model for emergency powers and the institution of the Roman uh, dictatorship, as uh, I'm sure the audience uh, know. So 
in times of a crisis, an eminent citizen was called by the, uh, by the ordinary officials and was temporary for a six month term of office, granted absolute powers in order to overcome the crisis and defend the Republic. Uh, now, since this, uh, this person that was termed a dictator was called to protect and preserve the control order, uh, rather than subverting it, it seems to me that this Roman dictatorship institution is the origin of this prohibition on amending constitutions during emergencies. Uh, if you look at Machiavelli, he notes that the dictator could not do anything that might diminish the state, take away authority from the senates or from the people, uh, and to undo the old orders of the city and make new ones uh, that would have been. So in other words, I think that in the ancient institution of the dictatorship, the dictator could not subvert or alter the Republic. And this is precisely what we're talking about. So there is a heightened risk during emergency for constitutional revolutions without a doubt. Mm -hmm. And constitutional revolution is not necessarily of, of, of the good, normal, desirable kind. I'm, I'm gonna just add one, one, one other thing to what said, if you actually <clears throat> look at the texts of constitutions around the world, and you note how many of them actually use the terminology of revolution, that in effect are declaring what they have achieved in the document that, that has been created uh, as revolutionary, uh, those regimes, and I don't have a list in front of me, uh, but I, I think you would agree with me if you followed up on this, those regimes that actually use the terminology of revolution uh, within them are the ones perhaps that we would be less attracted to because of the virtues of constitutionalism that we associate with a health, healthy uh, democratic uh, political, political order. Uh, so again, uh, the terminology of revolution within a constitutional setting can take us to very, very different places. Uh, and we just sort of stand back from that uh, and uh, uh, worry ourselves uh, about how the, how the term is used, uh, but uh, um, then leave it to others uh, to work these problems out. Thanks very much. I think uh, Professor Yap has a question for our authors. Once again, congratulations for the wonderful book and a very compelling presentation. I have just a minor question and perhaps you could help uh, uh, address it. So one of your central arguments, I believe, is there's often a time lag between constitutional change and constitutional revolution. So I'm just wondering, does that time lag primarily hinge on how power is consolidated or divided in the political system. So for example, in a authoritarian system like China or Singapore, where power is consolidated, consolidated by one party, whenever you have a formal constitutional change, it would take effect almost immediately. On the other hand, if we are talking where you have a more pluralized political system, where you have multiple veto players, even if there is so-called a moment that might be vetoed or forestalled or delayed by the other veto players. So even if, say, the Supreme Court of India were to hand, no, sorry, say the Supreme Court of Pakistan were to hand down a, uh, a decision that lays down some basic structure theory, that can be delayed or overturned by the military, which is practically a independent branch of government in the uh, in, in, in that political system. Yes, well, I mean, uh, the, the basic presupposition of your question is one that is uh, 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 deeply entrenched in our analysis, which is to say there is typically an extended period uh, for revolutionary change to ultimately become consolidated. And even that consolidation uh, is not as uh, entrenched uh, as one, uh, as some people might hope, given uh, the reality of constitutional uh, uh, orders, uh, uh, meaning the, uh, uh, the, the, the disharmonic features of all constitutions. 
Now, I would even go so far, and you might want to resist me here, uh, with regard to your example of those authoritarian systems that presumably are able to simply announce the change and then it has occurred <clears throat> simple, simply by virtue of an edict through a dominant party or ruler or what, uh, what have you. I think if you actually examine those cases very closely, uh, you would find in most instances that there is a disharmonic strand within that society. It may be weak, it may become stronger, uh, uh, it may lie dormant for, for years perhaps, uh, but at some point become activated uh, in a way that then uh, interacts uh, with the ascendant view uh, causing some uh, uh, delay, if you want to put it in these terms, in the actual realization of uh, uh, revolutionary change. Uh, so that it may come faster or slower, uh, uh, depending on the system. The speed, I think, uh, is a reflection in all instances of the balance of these disharmonic strands within any given constitutional and political order. Um, Alex, can I, can I add something for the um, COVID-19 question? Please. Uh, so uh, when you think about it, COVID-19 pandemic uh, basically emerged, as we all know, everyone who's doing comparative control knows, in this era where a large number of countries are encountering challenges to democracy by populist, semi-authoritarian trends and, and leaders. So I think the question arises whether and to what extent the pandemic can affect these challenges. Uh, now, I think that from what may be currently be observed, the pandemic can affect existing populist trends in several ways and, and potentially even conflicting manners. So the most obvious concern is that the pandemic will be used by populist leaders as an excuse and, and uh, disguise for, for power grab as I've mentioned earlier. And, and you can see some preliminary comparative research indicating that there is a, basic for such a basis for such a concern. For example, if you look at Hungary and Isra in Israel, uh, for example, although courts has been able to some extent to mitigate these concerns. But the pandemic, I think, can affect populist trends in additional more nuanced ways. So the first one is through the central role of science and the role that scientists play in the pandemic. So one of the main characteristics of populism is its anti-elitist, anti-institution rhetoric, et cetera, uh, and, and presenting the populist worldview as the ultimate and only truth. I think that the pandemic brought science and, and scientific facts into the center of the public discourse. And now this does not imply, of course, that it's always respected as we see uh, in the US. Uh, not everyone are taking seriously uh, scientific advices. Uh, but overall, I think it appears that the scientists uh, are still, uh, still have the upper hand in this case. The second important issue is the blurring uh, in the context of COVID-19 of the friend-enemy distinction upon which populists uh, build. Uh, so here too, I think there can be identified, we can identify contrasting trends. On the one hand, COVID-19, uh, the, the virus, does not distinguish between different ethnic groups, political rivals, etc. But on the other hand, it serves as a Critics for xenophobia, for blaming minority groups such as Asians, Orthodox Jews, and others for spreading the virus, uh, or uh, as, a, as a tool against protest. These are uh, uh, spreaders of the virus. So it could, on the one hand, it could also enhance this enemy friend distinction. And finally, and here I'll end, COVID 19 crisis may have a significant effect on globalization and post World War II world order. So the populism is generally regarded as anti institutionalist. And we know that populist leaders often attack international law and its institutions. Now, the pandemic led to a process of internal convergence, uh, which accumulated with the border closing uh, uh, and nearly shutdown of global aviation. Now, international bodies have had relatively, I think, uh, have been relatively weak in their response to this pandemic. Uh, uh, and these processes could potentially uh, accelerate nationalist, anti-internationalist trends and strengthen populism. But on the other hand, and here I'll finish, countries have continuously consulted and learned from other countries on how to respond to the crisis. 
there are new uh, alliances, etc. Uh, uh, and also, of course, the scientific effort to find the treatment. So I think this could also enhance uh, more globalization. So just to sum up this, this reply, COVID-19 crisis may affect the existing populist challenge to democracy in complex ways, which may pull toward different directions. I uh, thank, thank you very much, Yaniv. I, w I have one uh, question uh, just uh, before I, I uh, conclude this session uh, for both authors. If you could reflect a little on where you see the direction of the study of constitutional change going. So for, to put it sort of bluntly, if, if the community of scholars were to take up your concept in the way in which you would like them to, uh, where do you see this, this research tra trajectory taking us? Um, do you think this is something that could be operationalized in a large end quantitative study, for example? Is it something that would be best pursued perhaps through more in-depth qualitative case studies of some of the examples that you talk about or other case studies which aren't discussed in the book, which you think would be very fruitful? Where, where broadly speaking, do you see the, the field going if it were to take up your idea? Uh, yeah, I need, you want to go first? <laughs> All right, thank you. That, that's a wonderful question that we need to think about. First, about the empirical one, I think, yes, I, I certainly agree with that. Um, David Law has a recent chapter in the um, Routledge Handbook on, on Control Change on how to empirically examine control replacement uh, in contrast with uh, Ginsburg et al.'s book on, on the endurance of national constitutions that focus on the form. Uh, uh, David is trying to look at the substance and how can you measure uh, uh, the quantity of, of, of change. So I'm, I'm sure that our formula could, in that respect, uh, uh, be of certain assistance to the field. Uh, I think that, at least from my own personal perspective, so far uh, focusing on amendments, I think that uh, what we will come to see more and more are questions on constitution making, constitution replacing, both with regards to procedure, what would be the more uh, uh, legitimate way to have a total con constitutional replacement, which kind of mechanisms of, of design, uh, but also questions that concern substance. What are limitations on new constitution making process? Imagine a, a, an amendment or some change, even a formal replacement that would alienate part of the population. Would this be a legitimate uh, constitution making process originating from we the people? <laughs> Uh, if it undermines uh, the own raison d'etre of, of, of we the people. So I think that our book uh, could be useful both to more empirical case studies on the ground, but also to develop both theory and, um, and, and design for a constitutional replacement. Yeah, um, well, a couple of thoughts, uh, one on the more empirical side. So I think one of the critiques of this book uh, from those perhaps more uh, quantitatively oriented uh, in the kind of research they do is that, well, when exactly, how much change is required for a, a transformation to be considered revolutionary? Uh, I'm perfectly open uh, to uh, such a possibility. Well, whatever skepticism I might have about the success it would have if somebody could actually develop some kind of large N uh, uh, um, analysis, uh, which would uh, actually be able to determine, you know, when that tipping point actually occurs. I mean, I think there's something, uh, we think one of the virtues of this book, uh, others might view it uh, as a defect, but we think one of the virtues of this book is to invite this kind of discourse and conversation of the sort that, for example, uh, uh, Krista Kovacs' question raised, you know, about uh, uh, whether it's a good idea uh, to attach the label uh, to X or Y, given that X or Y could be understood very differently. That's the kind of conversation I think that is very, very helpful and, and, and productive and trying to work our way through these difficult problems. And yet, if there is a way in which it could be somehow uh, more definitively marked in terms of uh, the actual onset of such uh, change, perfectly open to 
uh, open to that uh, uh, to that uh, 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 poss possibility. Uh, I had another thought which uh, has escaped me at the moment, but uh, uh, it might come back to me in a second. So I'll, I'll just add to that. I, I alluded to that earlier, but I, I might say a word before uh, uh, and let Gary uh, some time to remember the second point. Uh, so in the, in the chapter on constituent power, basically we leave open many of the questions concerning we the people and the involvement of the people in control change. And uh, we emphasize in the book that there is no clear formula for when it is a legitimate change of, by, by we the people. Uh, but I think recent examples of uh, control change or attempts of, of major control changes uh, in, uh, in Iceland and Ireland uh, are, could be a fruitful ground for trying to think of different mechanisms for involving the people uh, in order to make the control change more legitimate uh, and, and have a better product. Uh, uh, so we know there could be different mechanisms for considering assemblies, etc. So I think um, just connecting it to my earlier observation on what would be a legitimate uh, procedure or design for change, the, the, the way that the people are involved and how we can actually understand what the people will is, because the people never speak in one voice, uh, this would be a tremendous challenge to the, um, to the scholarship. Yeah, I think uh, the point has sort of uh, come back to me, uh, provoked by what, what Yaniv just said. It seems to me uh, one of the uh, projects for the future that I think could be extremely valuable uh, would be an effort that focuses on constitutional origins and then how those beginnings actually uh, impact what later ensues. So for example, if you contrast the Indian Constituent Assembly with the American convention and ratification process, one could only conclude that the American process was much more democratic in terms of the degree of popular input. Not to, the, not to say that, that it uh, was a, a successful exercise in political democracy, but it was more democratic than the uh, elite driven effort uh, in the 1940s in, in India. Uh, but that elite driven effort was in some ways a reflection of the fact uh, that uh, uh, the Indian population was not yet democratic, that the constitution itself was an effort to constitute a people uh, that would be more democratic. And that what followed from that convention, from that constituent assembly was uh, the unfolding of a social revolution, which would again achieve a democratic population. So it may very well be that the undemocratic origins in some constitutional systems is precisely what's necessary in order to achieve a revolutionary result uh, that only follows uh, after uh, the document has created a citizenry uh, that is uh, prepared to accommodate those changes. Uh, I think that kind of relationship is one that would be a very fruitful one to explore. And of course, Alex, perhaps the best, uh, the most important development for the future would be the constitutional status, uh, not only in the national level, but in the sub national level, the constitutional status of cities and mega cities. This, of course, would be the most important uh, next development in comparative constitutional studies. And well, the, book is now, the, the book is now out. Ron Herschel has just written it. Yeah, I was going to say it's great that you mentioned that because our next uh, CCPL book talk will be with Ron Herschel about his book on cities, which uh, I think will define that uh, that scope, uh, scope for study of that topic there for years to come. So uh, thank you both very much for joining us today. It was a real pleasure um, to see you here, even if only virtually, uh, and chat with you about this excellent book. And uh, thank you all to those in attendance. 
Uh, and um, I will actually say a special thanks to Professor Jacobson for joining us at, uh, in his particular time zone, because it's been uh, probably a bit more of a stretch for him than it has been for some. Um, and so uh, with that, um, I uh, will just, uh, I uh, will hand it over to our director, Professor Yap here uh, for a closing word. Thanks very no, much. Just saying, thank you both. And I hope to see you again live and then good morning and good night. <laughs> Well, thank, thank you, you for having me. Thank you, everyone, for the invitation. Yeah. Thanks very much. Take care, everyone.